All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Today is Thursday, April 20th. You are at MS Office Hours. My name is Heather Cox, and with me today are my co-hosts. Hey, everyone. I'm Stephanie Stevens. Hey, I'm Garrett. And I'm Andrea Singrio, and we're really excited today to have Josh with us, and I'm going to hand it over to him with the coolest little lie hump in the back of his office ever that I need <laughs> for my office. All right, Josh, now you can really have it. Thank you all so much. It's great to be here. And this is a super fun community. Like this is the best meeting I've been on probably all week. So so thanks for that. Um, do one of you mind making me a presenter? It looks like I'm still an attendee. Oh, I thought I already did that. But I'll try one more time here. Oh, I did. And then it went away. So I will go do that unless somebody gets to it first. Try one more time. Make a presenter. I got it. I think I got Wait. it. Okay. I don't have the option on my end today. Cool. Okay, there we go. Uh, yep, I see myself as a presenter now. So I have a couple of slides that I just want to cover real quick over the, the topic for today, and then I'm going to jump into the fun part, which is the demo of this. Um, so real quick, my name again is Josh Leparati. Uh, I actually work inside of Teams Engineering as a product manager. Some of the products that I own are our open source app templates. So things like Company Communicator, Champion Management Platform, some other ones, plus our latest one, this Teams Emergency Operations Center falls within our group. So our group does a lot of work, uh, both with all of these, we own these, as well as a lot of community work. So if you've ever been to a Microsoft 365 Champion community call, or visit at adoption.microsoft.com. That is our team. We're called Customer Adv Advocacy Group. Man, that's hard to say, um, but I work with a lot of great folks on that team. Uh, so again, happy to be here. I know I've talked with some of you and presented the Teams Emergency Operations Center, but I uh, wanted to, to bring it to this audience too. So real quick, uh, what is the Teams Emergency Operations Center? I talked very briefly about we own a, a number of these app templates. Um, and the reason that our team owns these app templates and we continue to pursue new features and invest in areas within these app templates is really to help give you all a place to start a custom app with. Um, so we recognize that, right? This is uh, probably the next intro into if you've down if you're down the team's journey and you start thinking about, hey, how can we really leverage Teams and Microsoft 365 all up to get more investment potential and get more use out of the solution as a whole? Um, how can we start bringing business functions into it? A great place to start is with a Teams custom app. Um, so these app templates operate as those. Uh, they are, from our standpoint, the code that we release production ready. Um, they're also open sourced. So if you would like to make changes to this, you are more than welcome to. We actually have a lot of community input uh, that may be in different branches or different forks of our solutions. We do manage and maintain the main one for that. Uh, so just wanted to kind of give give a playing field of where these sit. Um, so let's talk about Teams Emergency Operations Center and then I'll jump into the demo. What its main goal here is to provide organizations with kind of a center of gravity for where to go and manage incident response from. So when we think about incident response, we're talking a lot about emergency incident response, but you could also look at this in the framework of being any type of incident response. Some of the terminology may be a bit more specific for emergency response, but it could fit in a lot of different places. We started with our own response efforts and seeing that we had some gaps where we could improve a lot of the processes, meaning, hey, during pandemic response, great. Yeah, we use teams and we deploy teams for response groups and had teams stood up for that incident response. But over time, as we either learn better practices about how we want to deploy resource groups out and deploy assets out, or even have a central place to see what we're tracking, right? What are we responding to? What's the status of these? We, we didn't really have that. So fast forward a little bit, um, our team got to pick up the joy of taking the feedback, both from internal Microsoft and from a number of state agencies around, hey, how can we go and bring these benefits in? What we want to do is build on top of Microsoft 365 components that are already there in the environment, help kind of stitch those together so that when we deploy, we're using and leveraging the benefit of the entire suite, and we make that an easy process. We make that a repeatable process where we don't have to go add in unique assets every time that we want to respond to an incident. So that's where Emergency Operations Center got its start. Um, within the Teams Emergency Operations Center, there's a number of cool features, and, and these will be the last two slides, and then I'll get into the actual demo. 
Um, but this is what we think about, right? Where we go and serve the function. Uh, so we've got a central dashboard where you can go and see all the incidents. When we think about deployment of these incidents, we're deploying based on a role model. So think about the different groups in your org uh, that may be responsible for providing assistance or that would be on point for response efforts. Those would be those role specific groups that we tag and add into incidents for response. Um, this is records management and notifications. We're leveraging native apps that are already there. So records management and SharePoint, notifications and mobile apps inside of the Teams, uh, Teams app there. And then for situational reporting, a lot of work around how you can leverage SharePoint news or other elements, again, within the ecosystem to go and provide that information out. Um, secondly, we have a few others around how we can speed up the time to deployment, right? Can I can set default users and default users to roles and incident types? Um, I can view the history as I go forward and make modifications to my incident. Um, and then we also got a lot of language support there for multi multilingual support inside of the app. Uh, so let me jump over and I'm going to share out my demo environment and I will walk through a simulation of responding to an incident. So one moment. All right, so I am up in a demo environment where I am centered right now in my Teams Emergency Operations Center dashboard. Here's the story of, of what's happened to this point. Um, in my organization, we potentially have a team dedicated to our emergency response. Inside of this team, I've probably got other SMEs or other folks that are gonna be responsible for responses to incidents or our own point for assigning responsibility to incidents. Um, within that group, those are the folks that are going to be interacting with the Teams Emergency Center and Teams Emergency Operations Center day in and day out. The other side to this story is those folks that I assign for response individuals. Those folks are going to use Teams and all the native apps that they're already used to and won't have to come into TIAC to do that response effort. So we think about it in two ways, right? The main app here is for those folks that are going to be managing and maintaining the life cycle of an incident inside of Teams to manage the deployment to your resources that will go and do the response efforts inside of just the native teams, right? Inside of the team, the channels, and the other experiences that get at it. So here's what's happened. And we, we are in our emergency operations center. We're homed as an app in Teams. You can see I'm pinned in a channel here. I could run this as a personal app as well. Um, but I have something that's come to me, right? There's been some escalation of an event that needs uh, that we need to provide a response effort for. This is where TIAC really shines because I can start to uh, very easily deploy out resources for that. So you can see I've already got a few incidents that I'm dealing with. I'm based in Louisiana. All of my uh, uh, demo stuff is in Louisiana because I'm not good at making up stuff on the fly. Um, so within my dashboard, I've got different areas I can filter on, right? I can see all my planning incidents. Uh, I can see all that are active or any that I've closed out. Uh, in a moment, you're going to see me make a new incident and just know that you can change a lot of the parameters too. So when you see incident types we're pulling from or roles, you can modify those. So it can be specific for your organization, for your group uh, on what you want to pull in. From our design decisions here, we use Microsoft List that gets deployed during the configuration here so that you can easily manipulate that data and that you can easily start to do automation tasks or reporting tasks on top of it, right? List is very easy to go tap into Power Automate or into Power BI. That's why we wanted to leverage existing platforms that were already there to service this. So it's also a good showcase of how you can integrate Microsoft List with a Teams app like this. So I'm in my Teams app, I got the escalation, there's some incident, we need to do a response. I would come into here and click Create New Incident. From this point, I'm gonna get a standard form that I would fill out for every incident type. And so I'll fill this out and I'll talk through the fields real quick as I fill it out. Uh, incident name, that's gonna be whatever the current incident is. Uh, I've been on a hurricane roll, so I'm gonna use Hurricane uh, Echo. Incident type. You'll see in this drop down, this is a list that I'm pulling from. So from here, I would choose the incident type that's uh, closely related to this. Uh, you can see I've actually got a hurricane incident type, so I'll pick hurricane. Start date and time, anytime in the past, present, or future. Um, a lot of times you may be creating an incident at, at the moment, right? We've got some issue that has occurred. I need to make it right now. For a hurricane, maybe we have a couple of days warning, a week's warning. So I could. I could set this in the future and have it as a planning incident instead of a active incident, right? All things I could configure through this. But for right now, let's say that 
Uh, this is actually going to land on the 25th. And my incident status, I'll actually mark as planning for now. I don't want to move it into an active state. That's going to reflect on my dashboard with where that's located. Next is my incident commander. I'm going to use the user I'm logged in with, my administrator. This is looking through my local directory. So anyone in the organization I could assign here. Um, I could also, you know, I don't have to assign myself. I could pick anyone else and assign them as a commander, and they would be on point basically for this incident. Location, I will just use Louisiana and then description inbound hurricane. Um, typically, right, you probably fill this out a, a bit more. This information gets stored in a list for our incident transactions that we can then later go and report on, take some automation actions on, and also reflects both in our dashboard and in the team build out that's about to happen when I click create new incident. Next, I'll set my severity. We'll go with critical, another dashboard element that'll show me some, some different filters there. Now we get into role assignments. So role assignments is when I think about, hey, I've got a hurricane incident. I've probably got folks that I need to pin to start working this incident or responding here. Uh, so I'll hit this drop down. Again, I can configure this list. I can add a new role right in the window, or I could go to my list uh, before I go and deploy incidents and have this already created for my roles. So here I'm going to start picking some roles. Uh, see, I've got a hurricane SME role. Now, when I pick that, you see I had some default users that came up. I can assign default users to my role assignment, so I don't have to pick them every time. Now I could come in here and add more users or take these out if it's unique for this incident, or I could go with the defaults. I'll go with the defaults for here. And so as I build this out, you'll see on the right-hand side, uh, I start to add some roles and users into here. Um, EOC coordinator did not have any users, so I'll just pick two users. Um, like, like I can assign defaults to the roles, I can also assign defaults for my role groups into the incident. So what that means is I've got this tick box, I could select that, and the next time I create a hurricane incident, that right-hand side would already be filled out. So again, it speeds up my time to provide these resources out to my response group. So I've pretty much completed what I would do from this form. Typically, I'd go a lot faster on this, but uh, you know, we wanted to explain out what happens here. Um, now, there's a few things that are going to happen in the background, and this is the purpose of right why we have TIAC here. So what's about to happen is when I click create new incident, TIAC, and I didn't say the acronym, but Teams Emergency Operations Center, TIAC, we love making acronyms up. Um, but TIAC will go make a series of calls into Teams and do a few things for me, and it'll do these same things every time. It'll make my team based on the information I gave above. Um, it'll assign these users into the team for me. It'll make five specific channels based of our based off of our incident response template it'll add some unique assets into two of those channels and i'll show those in a moment um, and then it also makes tag groups so as we start to get more comfortable and while i'm talking i'll go ahead and click create new incident if you want some fun watch on the left hand side you'll see the team build out um, i know that's that's a super fun part of this but uh it's it's not that fun so i'll click create new incident um, what we're going to do all the things i just said Plus, we're going to make tag groups. So I'm going to make a tag group for Hurricane SME and this team. I'm going to assign these users to it. I'm going to make a tag group for EOC coordinator, assign these users to it. A lot of this is a story point to say, look, you know, we've gotten comfortable, hopefully, with using at mention and calling users out by name so that they get notifications and appropriate notifications. When I start to invest in the tag groups, I can now say, hey, you know what, for response group, you don't have to know that Diego, Allen, and Isaiah are your hurricane SMEs. Just at mention hurricane SME in this response group, and they'll all get the message. So we start to hopefully showcase some more of the potential of how you can leverage Teams to be that modern collaboration platform. So you can see it's almost done here. Uh, my channels were built out. I was kicked out back to the dashboard. Um, so now I've created my incident. The folks that I just assigned just got a native Teams notification saying, hey, you've been added to a team, you've been added to a tag group, here's the information. They're hopefully going now into the team and they're doing their response efforts and they're working in that team to do whatever is required for that. So from the TIAC standpoint and from my kind of role in TIAC as maybe an incident commander or EOC admin, I have now deployed out a resource for them to go use and any of my standards that I've developed over time, maybe I've customized this app to pick up on that. So maybe I've got some unique channels or other unique assets that I would add into the team every time. That's all gonna take care of every time. So I don't have to go to the individual team, add all the different items to it and do that configuration each time. 
this will do it for me every time. Basically, it's you know, it's a very uh, a very detailed template creation for my response effort here. So what else would I do right in this context? I could go and make some edits to this incident. So as the EOC folk or EOC uh, admin here, maybe over time this incident has changed. So if I click on edit here, I will go in and almost the exact same form minus I have a reason for update. Hopefully they put a better update than what I put, but right, I just, I got to make an update. Um, we're going to switch into an active mode now. The hurricane has moved up um, and I need a public information officer assigned. And those are the two updates I'll do. Uh, so what's going to happen is we're going to go make these updates to the team, right? I'm going to reduce, uh, or I'm going to add that, um, add that uh, tag group and that user into the team. They just got notified and I move my uh, status from planning to active now. Now, from that standpoint, you know, I've edited the incident. I could also come and look at the history of this. We'll only see two items here, but over time, right, you would imagine a lot more would happen here. Uh, my first entry was when I first created the incident. You can see all the information was new. So over time, if in the EOC, I need to see what has changed, what's going on with this deployment, I can go and check that. So I could step up on the timestamp, see what's changed. We actually give you two views, a list view, which much more data rich here, and then a table view where I can come and just kind of quickly scan, right? Any text that is uh, present in these rows would be something that has changed. I can see the only thing was my incident status to active. Um, and then if I clicked on view roles, I would see some roles there. Uh, beyond that, right? I can also go and manage different aspects. So I talked about the incident types and roles. This is where I could come and click and go modify those in the list. I could also modify the team name. So we have a standard that gets deployed out. You can change that to fit whatever it needs to be, right? We just, we throw a standard in there, but it's fully customizable. When I click on incident types, you'll see, again, this is a straight list. I could come in here and modify this list. That would pick up in my Teams app and I'd be good to go. One thing I do like to show in the list is we have a number of lists that get deployed. Think about this as the functional kind of back end of how TIOC runs. These lists are what drives both the reporting or any of the captured metrics that we're showing on the dashboard or the functionality being brought into creating an incident, like any of my default values. So if I wanted to build any of that information out in the list, I could. One of the main things I show is that inside of the incident transactions, this is where I could start to come and think about, hey, how do I want to make some automation action, right? If I change the status, do I want to send an alert out? I could do that. Um, if I have different people assigned, take some different action. I could also do Power BI reporting. Again, this is straight on top of a list, so maybe be, it's already familiar, but uh, we don't require it because we don't want to require the licensing for it. But if you've got Power BI licensing, you can easily take a step up from our list and go and look at it in a map view, sort on it just like you would with any other rich data there. Um, so a great way that I could provide situational awareness without giving folks access into the dashboard that maybe don't all need to be in a dashboard. Um, so that was a pretty quick overview of kind of the administration side of creating an incident, managing that incident, looking at a little bit of the back end of how that data is manipulated. Um, and what I can do from within the team's emergency operations center. Real quick for two minutes, I'll also talk about the response side. So we keep it pretty simple there, right? We want it to be easy for folks to respond and, and do the work that they need to do without learning new systems. And that's one of the things here is stitching together the Microsoft 365 platform so they have access to what they've already gotten accustomed to using and can quickly go without learning a new tool. So I'm going to use uh, this hurricane. Uh, season preparedness because I've got some information preloaded here. Um, I talked about the channels that we create, right? You can kind of see these channels here. We also add in two unique assets, mainly for showcasing the art of the possible, right? What could you also add in? You could add anything you wanted to. You could add different channel apps. You could add different experiences to be deployed into this. We do two just to, again, show what you could do. The first one is in assessments. We actually add a ground assessment list where you can showcase how you can go and capture information from a ground assessment and load that into a list and then have a conversation around it. So this is pre-built, you could change the fields, but we can very quickly assign this out to a user on the ground. They could go with their mobile device on Teams, capture it in this list, upload information, attach images, give geolocation information. So right, what are my lat longitude? What's my street address? And then we can take that off of the list and do lots of other things after the fact with it. So that's one point. 
on that, I can have conversations around this. I can use those tags I created earlier to uh, call attention and at mention the tag groups into this and have them have direct access into the ground assessment list. The second area that we add in is an announcements. We actually add a SharePoint news tab. So within SharePoint news, this is where we talk about, hey, how could you provide situational awareness updates out so that you could you could uh, you know have this go to either the team that's involved for the response effort or syndicate this news out to other groups that maybe don't need access to the actual weeds and the team of doing the response. That's where SharePoint News is, right? It's already there, it already functions. So in this example, I've got a news article that I, um, that I prepared. Folks in the team would have seen this from the announcements area and they would have seen a message there. I could also though, because this is SharePoint News, syndicate this out to another news site that where you know, maybe my executives or my other leaders have uh, a point to go to, where they're again, not in the team, but could get situational updates delivered there. And I get to serve both sides of it. Since SharePoint News already serves all those functions, we add the tab in, and then you could take and add the news articles to that. Um, so those are the two areas that we add in. Again, you, you could add in and customize beyond that. You could remove those. Um, that's one of the powerful benefits of why we release it open source and why we specifically drive that notion because you can take and, and build upon it uh, if you need to or if you like to. Um, so with that, that was a very quick demo. Um, I would leave, I'll put in the chat too, like where you could get started. Uh, there is a main landing page that we have for this that can get you both the information I just shared, um, as well as the overview of the solution and an overview of deployment and usage of it. Um, one of the biggest things that we, we drive on this one and all of our app templates is customer feedback. Um, we've got a lot of new features in our pipeline. Uh, I would, I would say look out for some announcements from us in about two weeks on some new features and, and an updated version too uh, that we are excited for but we don't do we can't do any of that without customer feedback so that's one of our central things is collecting listening and building that customer feedback into this so i thank you all for the time here Thank you so much, Josh, for joining us. Um, uh, just get ready. Um, you may want to give us a form for them to provide that <laughs> feedback or because um, this group is not afraid to provide feedback. What's it been called, Heather? Exhaustive. Exhaustive feedback. Um, so uh, again, they're not ready. And after these announcements, you know, we've got a couple more weeks this season. Uh, if you wanted to come back and join us again, we would also absolutely always welcome to, to have you with us. I'd love to. Thanks. Perfect. So yeah, those of you who had asked about recordings and slides, we will, it, Josh, if it's okay, and if and you can share those slides with Andrea, we'll get them sent out. And the recording, give us a second. Uh, don't bother requesting it in the chat, the permissions. We will get it loaded onto YouTube as soon as possible. And- We do uh, have one question, Heather. Oh, we do, Coming okay, from perfect. James. Um, where are the costs for doing this? Besides labor, obviously, only connectors, power app forms. What is a general overview there? No, that, that's a great question, and and thanks, Amy. I saw you call that out in the chat. So, um, the the TIOC site itself, no licensing requirements, an open source solution. There are some Azure components that have to be stood up for the app registration part and the app storage part. That's the fixed cost portion. Um, we have a cost estimate off of that link I just gave out. Uh, depending on your pricing structure, it's usually under $100 a month. It, it shouldn't go over that, um, but that's the, the rough ballpark there. Um, and so, yeah, there, there is no cost though for any, any TIOC service. Um, when you load this in your environment, it's actually a custom app. So you load TIOC as a custom app into Teams and you load the Azure portion into your Azure infrastructure. There's no central TIOC service you would connect to. It's all gonna be run by you in that infrastructure. Uh, that's why this is unique as a custom app. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, well we I technically have five minutes. I don't think we've ended early in a very, very long time. I know. So if there are any other quick questions, we've got Josh for five more minutes uh, before we uh, say goodbye. Now's your chance. All right, well. Okay, they're coming. I Oh, can you bulk import groups of users when the team yes. is rolled out? Um, so uh, there's a little bit of work. So we th there's lots of cool things you can do. 
Um, we've had that question before on, hey, I've already got like my roles and my role groups to find out. Can I import those in? Um, the, the short answer is yes. The little bit longer answer is that would be a power automate function to go and expand that group and add it into the list. But um, I've seen some customers that have actually taken that and automated it. So when they modify that role group, that gets pulled into it. Um, and then Nate, I see a, a question too real quick on Teams meeting being a part of TIAC. Wait about two-ish weeks and, and probably with, with our new announcements, you'll see some, some meeting functionality added uh, directly into that. Awesome. See, you even got a little tidbit of something extra there. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Josh. Uh, this was obviously a hot topic and we so appreciate you being here. I'm going to stop the recording. I'll get this loaded as soon as I can on.